Uh, for those of you that are here, and also uh, this is going out Facebook, so hopefully it gets out to the people that are actually watching on Facebook also. One of the things that we have now incorporated, and you'll see a lot of it about, is actually if you want to give online, this will tell you how to do it, how to set it up. And so a lot of times if you're not here, uh, you can actually still give to the church online. Okay. What it's saying is that basically you can, you can give three ways, okay? One is you can actually go to your phone, smartphone, and it doesn't matter whether you have an iPhone or if you have an Android phone. If you have an Android phone, you go to uh, Google Play or Play Store, and you pick up an app. It's called Tithe, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y, okay? And uh, if you have uh, an Apple T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. Or you can go to Apple, to the App Store, and pick up the same way. You can also do it on your computer, okay? If you do it with your phone, all you do is pick up, you pick up the Tidely app, and then when it comes up, it says, where do you want to donate? And you can say, search, and you put in there Calvary Baptist Middletown, and it will bring up Calvary Baptist Middletown. You can do, you can give one of two ways. You can give directly from uh, your debit card. You put all that information in, or you can, or what you can also do is you can also have it straight coming out of your checking account. All you do is put that information in. You can do a one-time gift, or you can do a recurring. For instance, if you get paid every two weeks on Friday, you can say, I want X amount of money taken directly out every two every two weeks on Friday. And what it'll do is, is it will actually then come directly into the church, into their bank account, okay? Or you can go on to, uh, next one is you can actually go on to, that's the mobile giving, uh, that's the one I just told you about, there it is, that's the app that's there. The other way that you can do is you can go if you've got a computer, all you do is go to the website, calvarybaptistmiddletown.org. Across the top menu, just type in give, and it will bring it up to you. You fill in the information, and then the money just goes and comes directly into the church. It gets tagged to your name. The other thing about it is you can go back out there, and you can look and see how, you, how you're giving and what's been recorded, okay? So it's an easier way to do it sometimes. If you're not here, you're traveling, you're visiting, whatever. And also, we have a lot of people that are watching us online. And so this is a way for them to also give to the church while they're watching. Okay? All right. Now everybody can just kind of chill and relax. So thanks for coming. Good morning. Some of you all are not with me. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. We've been talking about uh, a series called Forerunners, Forerunner, and actually talking about uh, John the Baptist. And so I've got the PowerPoint, and so uh, just kind of, I'll walk you through the first kind of parts of, of it real quick. So is there a video in there, or just straight to the PowerPoint, I believe? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, it says, Truly I tell you, among these born of women, no one is greater than John the Baptist has appeared. And you have to understand that six months before uh, 
Jesus was born, John was born. And so when we begin to look at some of the things that we've already learned about John, there's kind of 10 things, and hopefully you can see them. The first three things, number one, the forerunner, or John, was mentioned 23, in 23 chapters of the Bible. And understand that in the Bible, there, there is actually 1,189 chapters. And out of 1,189 chapters, John is mentioned in 23 of them. Number two, we learned that he was foretold in the year 703 BC. And again, in 425 BC, 700 years before John was to appear on the scene, the Bible talks about him. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number three, also in Malachi chapter three, verses one, four, and chapter four, verses five and six. But let me give you a couple of things that we haven't talked about. Number three, he was one of four people in the Bible that were prophesied to come. One, most important, was the Messiah. Jesus was prophesied in Genesis, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, all through the Old Testament. But these are just three of the places. There was another gentleman who also was foretold about in the Bible. His name was Cyrus. And Cyrus was actually Persian, and he was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number one. The Antichrist was also prophesied in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter seven and verse number 24, Revelation chapter 13 and verse number one. Hasn't it come yet? But, in Mount, but the one we've been talking about, the forerunner John, he was prophesied in Malachi chapter three, verse one, also in Malachi chapter four, verses five and six. Now, something interesting and intriguing about John, and that is this. Number four, the last words in the Old Testament spoke about John. In Malachi chapter four, verses five and six, 400 years of total silence. The last thing that God spoke about in the Old Testament was a man named John. And then when you come to Luke chapter one, in verse number 17, God's first words in the New Testament were about John. God spoke about John and for 400 years, he was totally silent. And then the first thing that he speaks about after his silence is John. That means he's kind of important, you know? It's not just a byline that God has there. But now let's talk about some things. In Numbers chapter six, in that chapter, you're gonna read about a thing called the Nazarite vow. And in the Nazarite vow, the Nazarites could not eat anything with grapes in it or drink anything that was fermented, which means I'm in trouble. I am not a Nazarite. You give me my grapes, I love my grapes. I can, I can get a, a, just a bunch of those grapes. And the best kind are cotton candy grapes. They are sweet. And, and, and I'll sit there, oh, you never had them? Oh man, you've gotta find them. You can only find them every, every once in a while, but they're, they're real sweet and they're good. They're better tasting than the other ones. The other ones are bland after you've tasted them. Huh? They are better, but they're good, okay? So anyway, a Nazarite couldn't eat anything with grapes in it or drink anything that had been fermented, okay? And guess what? In Luke chapter one, verse 15, you will find that John was a Nazarite from birth. 
So guess what he did not do? He did not eat any grapes. Now you understand why he ate locusts and wild honey. Because he also could not drink anything that was fermented. And um, can I tell you something? Honey will last forever. It doesn't go bad. So when John got it in his beard, he could eat it later on during the day. <laughs> it didn't matter. At one point, Jesus and Matthew said this, John came neither eating or drinking. And listen, listen what they said about John because he did not eat or drink, eat grapes or drink for men and stuff. Look at what they said. They said he has a demon. But in Matthew chapter 19, listen to this. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard. If he didn't eat or drink, he's got a demon. If he does eat, he's a glutton and a drunkard. So get the story right, which one do you want? Somebody that doesn't eat or drink or somebody that does eat and drink? I don't know about y'all, but I kind of like to be put in the same place with Jesus and just go ahead and call me a glutton and a drunkard. Because I, I, it, that's what you're gonna call me, I, that's okay, I'm in good company. That's what they call Jesus. So that's kind of cool. But look at what, remember, remember when Jesus, Mary had just found out she was pregnant with Jesus? And she came into the presence of Elizabeth and Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with John. And so when Mary, who had just now conceived, comes into the presence of Elizabeth, who already has John in her, in her womb, growing, remember what happened? Huh? The baby leaped. Luke chapter 1, verse 17 says this about John. He was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. Hmm. I wonder who laid hands on him. How would you like to have a baby inside of you that's full with the Holy Spirit? Some of you that men, we would have no clue. Okay, number one. But Jesus and John both came from a miraculous birth. Luke chapter 1 and verse number 18 says that, and we talked about this last week, that John's parents, Mary and Zechariah, Z-E-C-H-A-R, not Zechariah, Zechariah, okay, with an E, and my, my wife told me, she said, man, you just mispronounced it all last week. You call, kept calling him Zechariah, Zechariah. It's Zechariah, Zechariah. Okay, get the E in there. Okay, his parents were too old to have children, remember? And then remember what happened when the angel, or when the angel Gabriel told John's dad that he was going to be a father in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 20? Zachariah's mouth was shut when he doubted the angel's announcement. For nine months, He was shut up. Now some of you women might like your husband to have nine months of them with their mouth shut. You get God to tell, tell him that you're gonna have a child and he probably will shut up. So, number 10 is found in Luke chapter one in verse number 40, when it, when it said, when she entered Zechariah, Zechariah's house and, and greeted Liz, Elizabeth, 
or starting at 39. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary was present for the birth of John, or left sometime soon afterwards, okay? Because we know that she was pregnant when Mary came there, and she was to stay, and she was staying there, really helping her for the first three months of her pregnancy, and she was helping Elizabeth for the last three months of her pregnancies. Okay, so think about it for a minute. Your cousin is giving birth to the forerunner of your son that you are carrying, and he's going to tell the world about your son that's going to come along a little bit later. And you are there to witness the birth of the forerunner that's going to prophesy about the baby that you are carrying in your womb. You talk about being blessed. Mary was blessed in multitudes of ways. And what happens is this, and we were talking about this. When we read the story of Christmas, and we tell the story of Christmas, we always skip right to Jesus. But sometimes we need to understand that the story of Jesus started before Jesus was even born. And it started actually with the birth of John, six months prior. And so, it helps us to understand when we look at these, the story that we're going to read today about Zechariah, it's going to help us to understand some things as a parent. And here's what I want you to, or even as a person, and here's what I want you to understand today, and that is this. The title of the message is, Words Have Power. Words have power. So if you got your Bibles, go with me into, John, into Luke chapter 1, and let's start reading at verse number 57. And we're going to read quite a few, so I'll read it real quick. It's not going to be up on the screen, so just kind of listen. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she had a son. Then her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had showed him her his great mercy and they rejoiced with her when they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day they were going to name him Zechariah after his father but his mother responded no he will be called John then they said to her none of your relatives has that name so verse 62 so they motioned to his father to find out what he wanted him to be called he asked for a writing tablet because, remember, he couldn't, he couldn't speak. So, they had writing tablets back then. They didn't call them iPads. But even in the Bible, they had writing pads. And he wrote, his name is John. And they were all amazed. And immediately, his Zechariah's mouth was opened, his tongue was set free, and he began to speak, praising God. Verse 65, fear came on all those who lived around them, and all these things were being talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard about him took it to their heart, saying, what then will this child become? For indeed the Lord's hand was with him. Then his father Zechariah, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the, in the house of his servant David. Just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. He has dealt mercifully with our fathers and remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. 
He has given us the privilege since we have been rescued from the hand of our enemies to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of our God's merciful compassion. The dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. He hasn't spoken in nine months. And all of a sudden, his tongue is loose, his mouth is open, and guess what? He's got a lot to say. And when he starts saying it, he is, he is, he is worshiping God and praising God for all of these things. But verse number 80, the child grew strong, grew up, and became spiritually strong. He was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Just like Jesus, he was waiting for that day to make his public appearance, and then he came out. And when he came out, ladies and gentlemen, he came out with a message just the same way that Jesus did. And so we begin to see all of, the, all of this that was, that was going on. So what do we learn from all of this? What do we learn? That Zechariah, Zechariah and Elizabeth conceived six months later, Mary is con Mary conceived by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. For the first three months, Mary was with them in Galilee. We saw that in, in verse number 40. And as Elizabeth is now going into labor, Mary's preparing to go home. And we don't know exactly when she left, a few days before, a few days after. We, we don't know exactly what, but we do know that six months after the birth of John, Jesus was born. And the Bible will tell us. Because why? He began to tell us the things about his, about his birth. And I shared um, part of the story last week. And... Um, And I gave you a, a kind of a, a teaser. Remember Zechariah was a priest. And if you remember on the day of Passover, there was a once in a lifetime opportunity for the priest. You would be selected to be the priest, the high priest, once in your lifetime, you can be chosen to do this and never again. So if you were chosen to be the high priest on, during Passover, after the Passover meal, everybody had had their Passover supper, then the high priest would come into the Holy of Holies. And when the high priest would slaughter the lamb, get the blood, and then go into the Holy of Holies to offer up one time during his lifetime and once in the past, on the Passover supper at the end, he would offer up the sacrifice for all of the people. Remember? You remember that? Okay, so get this. After he would do that, he would go and he, he could, you know, do some other priestly duties, but he could never go back into the Holy of Holies. One time life. Remember what I told you about Zechariah? And this is important. Zechariah was getting old. Priest from the age of 30 to the age of 50. Outside of the Holy of Holies 
was another altar in which there was the shoe bread and there was the, the lampstand. And once in a lifetime for one week, for seven days, in the morning and in the evening, when that week, if your lot was, and you were chosen, then you could go in and for one week, 14 times in the morning and in the evening, you could then light the lampstand and the shoe bread, you could hold the shoe bread, and you could offer up, and you, you would uh, light the incense to offer up the prayers of the people for that morning and that night for one week, and then you're done. You had to be between the age of 30 and 50. Zechariah was getting almost 50. This was his last chance to do this, and he got chosen to do that, and then remember in the end, the angel came to him and told him he was gonna have, he was gonna have a son, and he kinda laughed, and then he became silent. Now, get this, and this will help you to understand. In order for a king to come, a king needs to be heralded about his coming. Who heralded, who heralded the birth of Jesus Christ? Remember we sing that song, Heart the Herald Angels Sing? The angels heralded the birth of Jesus. When Mary was having the baby, remember they were out there and they were singing and the shepherds became amazed. Okay. John was the forerunner to Jesus. He was the one to herald Jesus. Zechariah, so he was a priest from his father. He born in there. So he could perform the duty of a high priest when he became how old? 30. John is 30, is six months older than Jesus. When did Jesus start his ministry? When he was 30, when John could now become the priest and proclaim that the, the Messiah, which you had been looking for, is now coming. You want to know why Jesus didn't do his ministry till he was 30 years old? Because John, who was the priest, had to proclaim this is for the this is for the sins of the people. I am presenting to you the Lamb of God on the altar to get, and offering up the prayers for the people. So here he is. And this is what I'm saying. There is so much in here that, that, we, that we just don't understand and we don't learn. And, and, okay. Let me give you what I gave them on Wednesday night. And this one will blow your mind. In the book, in the book where in, in Exodus, where God is explaining to all of them that here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to build the temple, and in the temple I want the Holy of Holies, and, and, I, want, and I want the place with the shoe bread and all of this stuff. And so what they did was they had an altar in the Holy of Holies, okay? And if you read in there, you will find in the Holy of Holies there were two cherubims on each side of the altar. And so when the high priest would come, he would take and he would kill the lamb, bring the blood, 
put it on the altar between the two cherubims, and then he would break the incense as a prayer going up to the children of, of the nation. That was temporary. Every year, they would have to come back and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. When Jesus Christ was crucified on Calvary, Jesus was on the middle cross between two crosses. Forget who was on there. When it was, it is the same symbol of now, instead of the high priest putting the, the sacrifice on the altar and offering up the blood for the people temporarily, God was symbolizing. So when they saw those three crosses, they knew, and it clicked with them, this is the same symbol from what we were doing in the temple except that God was offering up his son on the middle cross with the blood. He was the priest that was doing the duty of the lamb on the cross between the two. And so this whole picture just fits through everything that's, that's going on and everything that's happening. So what, we're, what am I getting to? Here's what I'm getting to. God saying, my timing is perfect. My timing is perfect. You need to understand something. Jesus' Jesus birth was timed perfectly. But so was John's. John's was perfectly timed. When we also find out that Zechariah had lost his voice. And what did we find out in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 65? And in Mark chapter 1, verse number 5, we find out that the return, the return of Zechariah's voice was also perfectly timed. What did he say? Fear came on all those who lived around them, and all these things were being talked about throughout the country of Judea. Where were these people talking? It says, they all who heard about him took it to heart, saying, what then will this child become? For indeed the Lord's hand was with him. And we began to tell you that 30 years later, when John starts his ministry of preparing people for the Messiah, Mark says this in verse chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. John came baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. For 30 years, he's been preparing for this moment of preaching repentance. Because he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. The one you're looking for, he's coming. When we begin, begin to look, where did John start his ministry? It told us he started it in, in the whole countryside. And the people have been talking about him. And then we find that God had shut Zechariah's mouth and then reopening it. During that time when they were going to rededicate or they were actually dedicating John to God when he was eight days old at the circumcision, he was being dedicated. And what ended up happening was God created such a stir among the people that were there that they were never going to forget that day. We begin to see these things. And John's, all of this was perfectly timed. What else? The pregnancy of Mary was perfectly timed. In Luke chapter 2 and verse number 1, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. So what, what happened? They, it meant this. Joseph, who was engaged to Mary, 
they would have to journey from where he was working in Nazareth, going back to the place where the census was to be taken in that area, which was Bethlehem. It's like us, if they said, okay, we want to take a census of all of the people in Ohio. And what we want you to do is we're going to take the census in Columbus. So you would have to travel from your home to go to Columbus to be counted, if that was the place. And this was what was happening with Mary and Joseph. They had to go to, not by coincidence, they had to go by God's timing saying, you, you Herod, you think you're in control? Watch this. You're going, to declare, you're going to make a decree that a census is going to be taken. And you're going to decree that all the people from this area are going to have to go to Bethlehem because I've got a mother of my son that's about ready to deliver, and I proclaimed that he was going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And everybody said, what good thing could ever come out of Bethlehem of Judea? I also have his announcement is going to be among the biggest crowd of people. Everybody's going to be in Bethlehem of Judea that night. Now a lot of people, let me say this, the biggest event to ever take place on this earth went virtually unnoticed. Only by a few shepherds, a mother, a father, and part of God's creation that happened to be right by. You think about it for a minute. You go to a football game on Saturday, not, not on Sunday, okay, because this ain't going to happen on Sunday. You go to a college football game and there are some of those stadiums that can handle up to 100,000 people. And they'll play a game and they'll lose. 65,000 on a Sunday and they'll play a game and they'll lose. Go to a baseball stadium, you might have 25, 45,000 people cheering on and they'll lose. But the greatest event that ever occurred where people should have been shouting, they were all silent. We need to be vocal, not silent. We need to proclaim just as John did the registration men, and it happened that Mary was pregnant. And a lot of people say, was this a coincidence? No. If you go back into the book of Micah, 500 years before this day, in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse number 2, it says, Bethlehem Ephrathoth, you are small among the clans of Ju Judah. One will come from you to be the ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. What's he saying? His origin was from even before you were ever dreamed of. Jesus was. Even before this came about. And so let me say this to you. If you're frustrated because you think that God is moving too slowly, you need to let go of your frustration. Because God isn't running late. I hear this all the time. God, you're running late. Uh-uh. God, God's not running late. He's not tied up somewhere else and too busy for you. Let me say this. God's timing, ladies and gentlemen, is perfect. He is never early. And he's never late. 
I would say he's Baptist. Because most Baptists don't show up early. A lot of Baptists show up late. It's like, what time does church start? 10.30. Well, let's see, what time can I make my entrance? God doesn't do this stuff, okay? God arrives right on time to accomplish what God is going to accomplish, okay? And let me say this to you. God is going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish exactly the way he wants it to, to be accomplished and you want to know why? For maximum benefit and maximum effect. When Jesus showed up, it was right, on, right at the right moment to get the maximum benefit and the maximum effect. But a lot of people missed it. They weren't there. So what do we find? Let me say something to you. Every prayer you pray, God answers. I hear people say all the time, I'm praying to God and I'm not getting answered. Let me say this to you. Every prayer that you pray, God has answered. A answered. And he's answered it in one of four ways. Number one, when what you're praying is wrong, God says no. Just flat out, no. If what you're praying is wrong, you might as well just quit. Because what God has said is no. And let me say this to you. He isn't changing his mind. When the prayer is right, but you aren't, God says grow. In other words, wait. What you're praying is, is good. But it's just not the right time right now. Because you've got to grow into what I'm going to give. Because what I'm going to give to you is at the right time to get the maximum effect and the maximum benefit. When you're ready, I'll give it. That is the growing part. The third part is this. When the prayer is right, and you are right, but the timing is wrong. It's just not the right time yet, okay? Then what God says is, slow down. Slow down. You're right where you need to be. You don't need to grow. This is the right prayer. I'm going to answer it to you, but you need to slow down. You don't have to grow. Remember, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall... Uh, uh, um, and they, they shall walk and not grow faint. That's when it's slow. But, number four, when the prayer is right, and you are right, and the timing from God is right, you know what he says? Go. It is either no, grow, slow, or go. They all rhyme, okay? So it makes it easy for you to understand what's going on. And so the second thing that we need to get from this whole thing is this. John was going to be circumcised on the eighth day. And during the circumcision, during this dedication, Zechariah spoke some words over John. Okay? His mouth is now open, and he's going to speak some words over John. And let me say this to you. 
His words had power. His words have power. The Latin, what they would call this, is they called it the benedictus, or good words that you would, and remember what you would do? You would always have people give the benediction. The good words that you're speaking. And so they would be giving these things. And so here's where we're finishing this sermon this morning about words have power. Do you understand that words can actually shape reality? In Proverbs chapter 18, in verse number 21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Repeat after me, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Do you understand your words? What comes out of your mouth? How much power they have? So many times people may say, well, it's just my words, it doesn't mean anything. I was only kidding. But death and life are in the power of a tongue. For instance, you tell a child that they're stupid, or you tell a child that they'll never amount to anything, what happens to that child? That child will probably grow up thinking that they're stupid. They could be the most brilliant child and the capacity to have brilliance, but you have brought death into that child by telling that child that they're this. What happens to Bobby when his parents are always telling him, you can't, you can't, you can't? He becomes emotionally crippled and he becomes a person who can't. Can't do it. That's all I've ever been told is I can't do it. On the other hand, when someone tells their child that they really matter, guess what? They grow up thinking that really means something to maybe somebody. So at eight days of age, eight days old, John can't understand the words of his father, that his father is speaking over him here. He's a baby, eight days, eight days old. He's hearing these words, but he doesn't understand what's going on. But you know what? These words that his father spoke over him at eight days, ladies and gentlemen, had a huge impact on his life for all eternity. And it makes him into one of the greatest men that ever lived. What did he say? Luke chapter 1, verse 76 said, And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. You and I can't say this with integrity over our child. But you know what we can say to our child? And this is why, may I say this to you, this is why we do ask you that if you're a, a Christian parent and you have a child, you need to dedicate that child to the Lord. Because when you're dedicating that child to the Lord, what you are telling that child is you are a child of the Most High God. He's letting me borrow you for a little while, but let me say this to you. I am giving him to you, back to you, God, him or her, back to you, God, because he is or she is a child of the Most High God that you've let me borrow. So let me speak words over that child. And this is what John was doing. Or you could say this, Psalm 139, 14 says, you are remarkably and wonderfully made. 
Every child is remarkably and wonderfully made. I don't care who they are. I don't care who their parents are. That child is unique by God, uniquely made. We can say Philippians 4.13 to our children, you can do all things through him who gives you strength. It isn't me helping you, I'll help you learn, but it is he that will give you the strength to do it. Psalm chapter eight says, you were made a little less than God and crowned with glory and honor. You were made a ruler over the works, over the works of your hands. Words matter, ladies and gentlemen. Words shape the world. What you say, may I say to you, you need to think before you speak. So many times we speak out of anger and our words come out and we want to retract that real quick. We think it's a ruler, push the button and zoom it goes back in and everybody's going to forget about what you just said. No, they don't. It can be a husband, it can be a wife. You get mad, you say something to them, and then all of a sudden, I forgive you. But 10 years later, you get in an argument and tell me what gets brought up. Remember 10 years ago, you called me a fat slob? Remember 10 years ago, you told me that my cornbread wasn't as good as your mama's? Remember that? Well, brother, you can bake your own cornbread. I'm not going to bake anymore. Or I'll do one thing even better. You didn't like the way I ironed your clothes? Iron your own. And we think they don't matter. They do matter. They do matter. And we need to understand those things. Words not only can shape reality, but they can steer a destiny. Zechariah said, and you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. We could argue that, you know, God's destiny was for John to become a prophet, and he would have become a prophet no matter what his dad said. But let me say this to you. How much more easier is it to get that, to that route when you got a family supporting behind you. So many times, here's what happens. A child believes that God is calling them for a certain occupation, certain job, and God is wanting them to go in that direction, and the parents say no, I think you need to go to college and do this, or you need to do that. Failing to realize, hold on a minute, if God is calling them for that, it's a lot better if we are supportive of that calling. Not wanting that child to be what we want the child to be, but rather letting God decide what that child should be and then allowing us to come along with the side of God and helping to shape that child into the man or the woman that God wants him to be. And words do matter. So, if that's their destiny, then okay God, show me how, how to shape a child's destiny. Number one is you need to speak scripture over your children. You know what they have learned? If you're a mother or father or parents to be, and there is a child in your womb, you can read to that child while that child is in the womb, and it will have an impact on that child. <laughs> you can sing a song, and that child will actually experience that song in the womb. Uh, children don't do that. Hold on a minute. I think a child just jumped. Amen. <clears throat> yeah. 
This is where it bothers me when I hear people say, I don't know what it is yet. It isn't an it. Whether you know it's a male or female yet doesn't matter. It is a child. It is a child. This is why I have issues with, with the abortion and all the other stuff. You're not killing an it. You're killing a life. Whether you like it or not, it's life. And that child will experience those things. Let me say this. Parents, grandparents, every time you come in the presence of your children, I don't care what their parents do, okay? May I say this to y'all? Probably all of us, somewhere, someplace, that are grandparents, maybe. For you that are parents, you haven't reached this age yet, you've got children. And you are a Christian. And your child has decided, I am not going to be a Christian. And my, your grandchildren are not going to be children, or grandchildren, or Christians. They're going to be grandchildren, they're just not going to be Christians. And I don't want you bringing Jesus in front of them. You know what I'd say to them? Uh-uh. You can speak Jesus in front of them. And if you don't like it, bye-bye. I love you anyway. But I have freedom of speech. And you're trying to silence my freedom of speech. I hear parents all the time saying, I don't want my children doing this. But let me say this to you. We can speak scriptures over them. But we can also speak scriptures to them. Why? Because in there, ladies and gentlemen, with every child, do you understand that God has a promise for that child? Every child. I don't care who they are. I don't care how much money they have. I don't care what color they are. God has a promise for every child. Every child. And we can speak that in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 30. David claims this for himself. He says, when with you I can attack a barricade, and with my God I can leap over a wall. That's what I can do. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 13 says, I am able to do all things through him who strengtheneth me. Romans 8, 31 says, if God is for us, who is against us? What we need to tell our children is, Ariana, I don't care what anybody says. If God wants you to, you can leap over that wall. God will be with you. God will help you do those things. Logan, you're able. You're able, buddy. You can do those things with the help of him who strengthens you. Don't be afraid, Jalen. If God is for you, who, who for crying out loud can be against you? Here's the principle. Let Scripture guide your behavior and let Scripture guide your words. Don't be afraid. Words matter. Words have power. They shape reality and influence destinies. Friends, speak edifying words over your children, over your friends, and prepare to speak words in praise of God. And these are the things, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to do with our children, and that is to get ready to give those things to Him. So. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you can come in and give us a phone call if you would please at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship. 
prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, the time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven, we generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time, and we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you, and may God bless you.